Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly show where I have a guest and we get to chat about their perspective on movies. And we have fellow Filmstagrammer here, Tyler, joining us, so I'm going to let Tyler introduce himself a little bit. Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Beckett. Um, I'm an Instagram movie reviewer. I also uh, do some writing for um, Scribe Magazine, where I've done... Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. uh, where I've done some articles, um, mainly about storytelling and throw movies and that sort of thing. And that's just been a huge focus with um, what I write and everything is just pointing everything at storytelling, because I feel like that's just the most important thing when it comes to movies. Um, you can have big bombastic things, you can have some gory things, you can have some very hilarious movies. But all in all, we all love to be told a story. And I feel like that's the most important thing. So you can either find um, my author's page on Scribe Magazine on scribemag.com or you can find it, find me at T underscore T-U-B-B-Z reviews on um, Instagram. I need to change I tag so bad. <laughs> I need a rebrand, <laughs> um, which I will eventually. But um, that's all. But yeah, Dubs reviews on Instagram. I've uh, I've definitely enjoyed writing for Scribe since I started writing for them, and I uh, have a very specific thing that I'm doing with my Wasteland Vintage Roadshow. If I didn't mm -hmm. obnoxiously brand everything that I do in the same exact way, so gotta have fit things in together. Um, but getting to look at, like, I'm in the middle of writing an article about Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which is Ooh. 50 years old Yes, this year. So Gene Wilder, them Oompa Loompas. But getting to talk about movies is always great. So I'm glad you're here, Tyler. And we're going to get things started with the question that I feel like most movie fans get asked way too much, probably, is what is your favorite film? Well, I'll tell you, Shane, unlike most people, I actually know what my favorite movie is because I feel like that's such a daunting question because that's, because that's not what, unless if you really love movies, you don't really think about it too much. Yeah. Because even my dad's like, I don't know, Star Wars. I'm just like, okay, fine. I mean, that's not a bad pick. Yeah. But um, it's like a tough thing to think about because um, even the casual moviegoer, watches hundreds of movies in their lifetime or zero because you know there's crazies who don't even watch movies they exist i um, i had a girl in my in my classes in college that thought movies were a waste of time and did not mind telling me that i'm like you that makes me so sad that you would say that <laughs> makes you sad and frustrates me <laughs> because i don't i don't know it just seems so boring to me it's just like what do you do what do you do with your free time anyway let's get to the actual let me answer the question um uh my favorite movie as of mid high school for me was um shawshank redemption I think that's my favorite one. Uh, around that time was when I really started to actually get into movies. I've been exposed to movies all my life. Mm -hmm. That's something that my dad's really imprinted in me um, since I was so tiny. Um, but um, yeah, Shawshank Redemption for me is that, I mean, there's a couple of movies that are edging to that point. Mm -hmm. But Shawshank blew my mind um not because not just because of the twist yeah i feel like there's some movies out there that just blow your mind because of the twist and it just makes that a memory which is cool if you like that sort of thing or whatever but i like that was just an added cherry on top to the film and the film was all about this interesting journey of this innocent man and this hellscape and how he was still finding hope in a dark situation yeah and it's got great actors, a fantastic cast. It's directed by Greg Barabont, who's a fantastic director. He did Green Mile. Mm -hmm. He's not a stranger to making a very 
dark but very emotional film yeah well and i love dare bond and the fact that like he knows how oh, to adapt Bond. Uh, sorry continue he really knows how to adapt stephen king yes because between shawshank and the green mile and even the mist which mm-hmm. Movie will yeah. destroy yeah. you inside. <laughs> uh, but like Darabont did such a great job directing. And any of you who have listened to any of my reviews that had anything to do with Roger Deakins knows how much I love Roger Deakins. And mm. it's such a beautiful film. Mm. Beautifully shot. Mwah. Jeff's Kiss. And Tim Robbins, Morgan Freeman. And like Clancy Brown Mr. is so Krabs. <laughs> it's so weird to think about that's Mr. Krabs. Um and like even like William Sadler and um with James Whitmore. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah, he is Gross. so fantastic in that movie. Um I remember first watching the movie, I don't know what it was. I think I was just a teenager and I didn't completely see it, and I was like you know what, this guy's not such a bad dude at first. And then as I get older, I'm like, no, he was a jerk from the beginning. <laughs> like, he's, it's obviously, like, that's why I love is, like, all of the characters, all of them, even, like, the minor characters, like, there's so much depth. To yeah. Them. You get that, like, that, like, and that's just, like, a careful use, uh, usage utilization of the script Mm -hmm. and um i remember hearing a i don't know it was an interview or something where tom hanks talked about his experience on the green mile and with the same director and he said that even on the scenes that he wasn't in he would be standing in the background off stage um off set watching because it was like watching a uh a play happening Mm -hmm. it was always entertaining and he always wanted to be there to um when he needs to get on there he could play off of it and i i never really hear about um many other directors functioning a set like that um and to a degree to where it still feels like a movie Mm -hmm. because i feel like there's some movies out there that feel more like a play and they're adapted from a play Mm -hmm. There's there's definitely films that it's just like they never kind of transcend that. And you that's such mm-hmm. a great quote from Tom Hanks. What a professional. 100%. One of the one of the greatest. Now, Tyler, what's your earliest memory of going to the movies? Uh well. That's kind of a complicated question. I think the early, I think the earliest memory I have of a movie that really hit me wasn't. I didn't see this one in theaters because mm-hmm. I wasn't born yet, but I did see a sequel of it in theaters, and that's Jurassic Park. Okay, I saw Jurassic Park when I was four, and during a rainstorm, <laughs> uh, and specifically, it got really bad outside when uh, the when it's uh, Nedry, when it's um, Wayne Knight, and he's yep. about to be eaten by the Dilophosaurus. Yeah, I love to see it. I was in a dark room with Storm in the background. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but, um, no, like, that, I feel like, was the greatest memory I had because uh, even though I didn't see that in theaters, I saw Jurassic Park 3, which is not as good by any means. Mm-hmm. But I remember that what really captured me was Jurassic Park. I mean, obviously, Star Wars, yeah. Disney movies, but I feel like the biggest thing was Jurassic Park that just is just in my mind. Jurassic Park is so great. And it's one of those things where it's like it transcends just being that like popcorn movie. Mm-hmm. There's so much going on with it. It's so expertly crafted. And what a cast of characters. Like, everybody is so great. Goldblum. And, yeah, Gold, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he He's a character off, um, outside of a movie. 
Um, but even then, like, he... I don't feel like people really got to know him until that movie. Like, of course, he had to fly. Yeah. He was on other stuff. But it was really that movie where he really got to show um, what he can do. Um, also, Laura Dern yep. is such a strong character in that movie. Um, love what she does in that film. Um, and... Um, Dang it. Sam Neill. I love Sam Neill. Sam Neill, um, which you can detect a little bit of his accent. A little bit. Like, I hear it sometimes. A little sometimes. bit. But even then, like, you're right. It has a great cast. Even the Spielberg is a master at finding, most of the time, is a master of finding uh, great child actors, yep. great kid actors. And those kids could be so annoying, but they're not. Yeah. They're endearing. They're cool. One of them happens to be a hacker, but it's fine. <laughs> um, but uh, nah, it's a actual. It's a great classic. It's a great blend of CGI back then and miniatures and animatronics. So perfect. And I mean, we're talking about one of the greatest directors within the past thirty years. So, of course, playing like, with that, it is an, an instant classic. Um, but, yeah. So crazy. Spielberg, like, Jaws came out mm. over 45 years ago. And he's still doing it. Yeah, I think <laughs> I... When... No, yeah, it, it came out in June, right? Okay, so I haven't... All right, I'm thinking of last year. Last year, I watched it on its anniversary. Okay. Because it's on HBO Max. Yeah, so I watched that it. would have been 45 years, 2020. Crazy. But now, Tyler, do you have a particular favorite genre of movies? Oh, um, I don't think so. Somebody asked me that yesterday. I don't really... No, they asked me if there's one I didn't like. And that's not true. Because I feel like there's at least a handful of movies I would like. Mm-hmm. Because it's there's thousands of movies. There's going to be something that's for you. Yeah. And there's going to be some that aren't for you. Um, but as far as the genre that I... I mean, I love a lot of genres and they kind of feel the same to me. But I have to say probably animation. Okay. Um, I am so, I have probably seen almost every great animated movie, um, even anime. I've seen a lot of that stuff. Like animation, it, it's not even a genre. What am I talking about? It's not a genre. It's an art form. I feel like a lot of people consider it one, but mm -hmm. it's a medium on how we make films. And because that's the thing, because... I will, I do have to say, I feel like animation lends itself a lot to fantasy and mm. science fiction because a lot of those kinds of things are so hard to make work in live in action. In live action, yeah. That, because like you could just look at so much of what Miyazaki did in terms of fantasy and sure. like talking animals obviously look a lot better in animation than right. they do in real life. <laughs> or uh, Spider-Man to the Spider-Verse. He can't make a movie that looks like that. No, and just the style of- Scott Pilgrim tried, but not, and it succeeded to a level, but nowhere near to what Spider-Verse did. Mm -hmm. I know, um, I don't know how many of our viewers out there follow Magic of Film on Instagram, but- he had done a, uh, did a tournament for animated films, and that definitely helped me find some that I wanted to check out, like Perfect Blue and Angel Egg. Those are some very interesting ones that I at least have watched recently that were anime. And, but it's like, I have a soft spot for animation. I, um, it seems like every year I at least have one animated movie in my top 10 by the end of the year. I even had two last year. I love, well, actually I might have three. Where did soul land? I loved Wolf Walkers, but taking into all that into account, but now 
shifting gears to some more specific kinds of questions. But Tyler, do you have a particular favorite filmmaker? Well, now, as far as working, would have to be Denis Villeneuve. Um, there's not a movie I don't like that he's done. Um, my one of one of. My Um, is Blade Runner 2049. I love the original. Mm -hmm. The sequel is even better. I agree. And, which is hard to say with any sequel. Um, but this one, is, like, I've, Blade Runner 2049 is the reason why I feel like we're going to be okay with Dune. And um, I know a lot of people are concerned with Dune and they don't know about Dune and um, they're not sure if it's going to work. goes and goes and he's just allowing himself to do bigger and grander things and be able to do even crazier stuff where Nolan did that from the get-go. Is a um Man, I've, I can't remember what I said. I, I had a review on Prisoners. Love that film. And there's something in particular I said. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly glance at it real quick, if you don't mind. That is all good. <clears throat> is there a point I think I might want to make, so go ahead. I definitely see more and more comparisons between Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve. Mm -hmm. And... I'm a huge Nolan fan, and the more and more I think about it, I'm becoming such a huge uh, Villeneuve fan, too. And Prisoners is one of my favorite movies, and Blade Runner 2049 absolutely blew me away. And I trust Villeneuve with Dune, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that film when it finally comes out this fall. So that's definitely going to be exciting. Okay. Uh, one of the last things I said in my review was Villeneuve does what he does best. He shows us the journey without, explana without the explanation, but with plenty of motivation. Very and I think what I meant by that is um, we don't, I feel like with some people when they watch a movie, their biggest, um, where it's um, something greater that they're trying to tell mm -hmm. is somebody... The audience always wants to know what they're what what they're watching. They always want to know where they're at, what they're doing, what what they want to all the five who, what, when, where, how, all that stuff. Yeah. They want to be informed so they can follow you from beginning to end. And uh, they don't want you to deviate that much from it unless if it serves the story. Um, that's what I find to be true. And what I feel like what Villeneuve does is uh, he gives you enough to try and figure that all out as you're watching the movie. And he doesn't try to trick you. He just shows you the little bit of steps as it goes by. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a perfect, like um, Prisoners is a perfect example of that. Sicario is a huge example of that. It catches you in the first 15 minutes um, when they're in that siege scene. And um, Blade Runner 2049 really gets you. And I feel like a lot of people are expecting that movie to be a huge action, action piece. Yeah. Or it's not. It's a noir. Um, but it's an incredibly fascinating noir. And there's so much being said. And um, I know some people who just see it for face value and they see it and they're like, oh, it just feels like it's a twist and twist and it's just changing itself up. I'm like, no, it's really trying to tell you something more because of those things. Mm -hmm. It's really showing you this character's arc and really the meaning of humanity and the meaning of identity 
throughout this entire movie and how that can shape you and how that can manipulate you and um, also free you. And um, yeah. It's his work is on a whole different level. And it just feels like you're getting even something like also prison. who pairs up with Roger Deakins. Deacons finally got it. <laughs> Blade Runner 2049. Finally. He also did Sicario. Yep. And Prisoners. Oh, and you can you can tell. Like, I remember what like looking at Prisoners, that movie does not need to look that way. Mm-hmm. But the way that it does look is so striking. And even like I remember the shots of just holding on to a like a shot of a tree Mm. and you know exactly what's going on during that time but you don't need to be shown or told what was going on exactly you just have that feeling like something isn't right and then you start to like pull back and it's like something went horribly wrong Mm -hmm. during this time and prisoners is just to fall in line with those mazes. That's what it feels like. And by the end of that film, like that imagery is just so perfect with everything. Yeah. Uh, and, and what I love about that movie is I feel like to compare in Prisoners, um, around the time I rewatched Prisoners to do the review, I also watched for the first time uh, the American remake of uh, the, sorry, that's my niece. Um, uh, the uh, girl with the dragon tattoo mm. and I watched it and about 30 minutes through I'm like yeah I know who did this <laughs> and um, is it is it loud it's fine. can you hear it okay okay sorry um, <laughs> uh, but anyway so I figured out who it was because I feel like a lot of movies get into the trap to where you can figure out who is um, who's responsible for it because they show you within the first 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. They show you everybody within the first 30 minutes. If you haven't seen this person within the first 30 minutes, you know who it is. Um, But what I like, um, I don't want to get too much of a tangent, so I'm not going to say that the movie I just thought of. Um, but um, but when you go to prisoners, they show you who's responsible for all this, and you completely look over it. Yep. And I think that's a super well done um, because it's a psychology thing. Yeah. You wouldn't think that this kind of person because of how they look, because of how they portray themselves, would be the person who's responsible for all of it. They have a perfect alibi, but they are, like, it's just, to really do a really good whodunit sort of thriller, you really just got to bury it between the lines, and you just got to make it super vague, super unclear, or you got to distract other people from other things because um, because it can lead to a bit of predictability. And Prisoners doesn't do that at all. And I, it's such a journey, and every time I watch it, still it still hits me, and that's what makes it so great. And as much as I love Logan, Hugh Jackman's best performance. So. I remember watching Prisoners for the first time and being absolutely terrified mm-hmm. by Hugh Jackman. And those there's particular scenes where you're just like, I am horrified. The one when he's in the uh, the bathroom with the hammer? Yes, 100%. Because and... you feel the fear in the room, not just in them, but also in him. Mm-hmm. And it's insane. It's such a beautiful, like, layered performance. Because um, I don't want to give too much of a weight because it's such a good movie. You yeah. Watch it. Uh, I'm just looking at, like, Terrence Howard in that scene. Mm. Like, he looks legitimately terrified <laughs> of what's going on. Now, 
Speaking of actors and actresses, Tyler, do you have any particular favorite actors or actresses? Well, um, I feel like to perfectly answer this, I feel because I watch so many movies, I feel like it's important. It's impossible rather uh, to uh, have one favorite Mm -hmm. because I feel like for me, like, kind of like you have your favorite directors or whatever, like you can love a certain actor who's no longer working anymore. Mm -hmm. But you also can have a really great love and excitement as you're following a new actor who's at the height of their career, beginning their career. Um, And as far as like one of the older actors, I would, oh man, this is difficult. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna think about this earlier, but I didn't because I know it's a tough question. Um, I would have to say, it's mm, okay. I'm gonna go with the newer one because I think that's easier. That's fine. Um, sadly, because he passed, Chadwick Boseman, because I followed him since '42. Mm-hmm. As soon as I saw him, I'm like, this dude is going somewhere. He needs to go somewhere. And he did. And I was so excited with everything he got. I followed him ever since. And I was so depressed last September. And um, so crazy the kind of person he was Mm -hmm. and the great amount of integrity and uh, class and kindness and gravitas he was able to give not only as a person and not not just as a professional but also as a creative and uh you see that throughout all of his performances he never turns in a bad performance he never is in something where he doesn't belong if anything he makes it better yeah and um he was the perfect black panther and uh, he will live on, and he has a great legacy. Rest in power, and uh, Conan forever. I it's just I feel so cheesy saying that, but uh, I mean it. It's true, and they even named the next one specifically. Conan forever. It was perfect, perfect title yep. for this sequel. And um, I really trust Ryan Coogler to do it justice. Mm-hmm. I'm very and interested to see what they do with it. I, For one, I trust him as a director, and two, I love that he said, um, we're making the movie that Chadwick would want us to make. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, perfect. And I don't think people are going to, I don't think everybody's going to be on board with it, because I feel like this is a general thing with the MCU right now, because they're just taking swings, they're just doing it to do the best they can. Um, and uh, they're evolving. They're moving forward. And they can always do better um, with certain things. But I think they're really, really th- doing something different within this current phase. But yeah. back to your question and back to the older actor, I would have to say, man, I... I I don't feel like this will be, I don't, I think I'm going to change my mind 30 minutes after this conversation, but probably (laughs) I would have to say either Clint Eastwood and maybe Jeff Bridges. Two great picks. Clint's still Um, going. Hmm? He's still going 90 years old, (laughs) still acting. Yep. 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 Um, I think he's way I think he's a better actor than he is a director, personally. I feel like he's a very, he's a little too straightforward and a little generic. I'm not saying he doesn't give a good movie. I I think especially at this point, like... He, I feel like with him, he makes a movie like he was, he uh, grew up making a movie. He grew mm-hmm. to understand how to make a movie. And he didn't really change. All that changed was the story he wanted to tell. And I give him credit for telling the story he wants to tell. Uh, Richard Jewell was a great movie. 
because uh, he made that what it as grueling as it needed to be. He he is the most efficient of all directors. He goes in, he does it <laughs> sometimes to the detriment of the film. You know, you could have waited mm-hmm. for an actual baby for American yeah. Sniper, but yeah, <laughs> just throw in the fake baby. <laughs> Nobody will know the difference. Or do what um, Zack Snyder did and um, Man of Steel show a little, little too much baby, little CGI baby. It's I, especially at this. So like, I feel like Clint Eastwood is by far a much more consistently great actor than he is a director mm-hmm. because he has some great films, but he has all my favorites: Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Yeah, He's... and like. I'm a huge fan of the of westerns. I love mm-hmm. his work with Sergio Leone. I love Dirty Harry. Even his own films like Outlaw Josie Wales and Unforgiven mm-hmm. and Million Dollar Baby. But if you look at his directing career for like the past say 20 years, there's some stinkers in there. <laughs> there's a <some> bad movies. <laughs> and yeah. He he really the way he directs, he needs really great actors in his sure. movies. Um, and you know, um, I don't want to like, I don't want to like roast his, roast this guy, but like, I could turn, I can turn off one of uh, his movie if his son's in it. I'm gonna be honest. I'm like, uh, okay, cop out, off. <laughs> I'm not a. I'm not the hugest Scott Eastwood fan. Me neither. Um, so, I was rooting for him because I was a huge fan of his dad, and I was just like, oh, he can be good. And then after a while, I was like, no, he can't. No, he can't. He's definitely not Clint Eastwood. No. But, like, you can see the perfect example of what kind of director Clint Eastwood is is 1517 to Paris. Because it's really bad. Um, <laughs> the issue is he had the real-life people – playing themselves oh so they're not actors and it showed because the thing is clint eastwood's like you get like two takes maybe so you better go in and do your thing as an actor that's how he works movies like that don't really work i don't think i can't really think of one that comes to mind i don't know feel free to prove me wrong well Uh, that's how he is with all of his films is yeah. there's only a couple of takes, but the thing is, he relies upon really strong actors, which is, I love Morgan Freeman in his films, yeah. and, like, Morgan, Fe- Morgan Freeman's a great actor. You have somebody who's not a great actor, it's gonna show. And it shows in his movies. But, and then I love Jeff Bridges. Oh, man. And you get all different kinds People of People overlook his performance in Iron Man, He's so good in Iron Man. He's fantastic in Iron Man. He's great in Iron Man. It's, and what I love about Jeff Bridges is I feel like he could be more of a villain in more movies. Mm-hmm. Um, because in Iron Man, if you see him, he's as charismatic as he is in other movies. Oh, dang it. See, I told you I was going to think of somebody else. I just thought of Kurt Russell. Dang it. I love Kurt no. Russell. No! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh... But anyway, um, Kurt Russell in a similar way, it's like they're really good at being charming, of like mm. filling a room. But what I love about his performance in Iron Man is he is such a... Oh, man, what's the way to put it? Like he's... Like he... F- There's something not right with this guy, but he's kind of like of the... He's like an uncle. Like you're like, oh no, he... Nah, he's okay. He's probably okay. Yeah. He's probably okay. And then, like, bit by bit, you're like, oh, no, no, no. He's not okay. He's not okay. Get out of there. Get out. Um, the but where that movie takes a turn is when he comes in to the arc reactor and yeah. yells at the scientist. He's like, Tony Stark made this in a cave. It's a box of scraps. And, yeah. like, he's intimidating and scary in that moment and the guy's just like i'm not tony stark and the point where he can't believe lebowski did that to him man 
right? And when he puts that thing on Tony and that whole entire like sinister monologue he gives to he him. does a great job with controlling a scene. I wouldn't say controlling a scene. I would say taking charge of a scene when he needs to. Mm-hmm. Um, when it needs to be RDJ scene, when it, he needs to do it, he'll live. You let him guide the room. You let him guide the scene. You see that when he's got like the box of pizza and he's just like, all right, you want a slice? Here, you t- take a slice. I'll yeah. take t-. Like, you know, he's just like adding a little bit there, but it's mostly Tony guiding the scene, like saying what he needs to say. But when it's that scene, when he's there with the sh- um, at the couch and he's basically ripping his heart out. <laughs> yeah. Like, he's taking charge of that scene. When he t- turns it around, and he really uh, um, shows us that he's the villain. He um, he takes charge of that scene, and he immediately turns on uh, the threatening presence that he uh, was choosing not to show in certain scenes of the movie. And not just Iron Man. I'm like, you got to talk about Tron, Tron, and Tron Legacy. Um, I love Tron Legacy. He, I mean, I, it's not the most perfect movie. And in fact, the soundtrack is the biggest and best part of the movie. Yeah. I love his performance mm-hmm. as both cool. Clue and also as Flynn. He does a great, like, dual performance there where he's uh, the, where he is the old hero and he is the villain. Mm-hmm. And it's a great dichotomy that's there. And I mean, it really shows how good of an actor is when he can play two different characters that look identical to each other, um, but he's able to hold his ground there. He's able to not allow any either one break, and you're able to identify these two similar, similarly looking characters as different, as separate. Well, and he's definitely channeling the dude, mm. his older self. And Clue's intimidating mm-hmm. and powerful, and he has that presence. And it's I even wit like imagine if you had today like twenty twenty one technology going back and redoing Clue because like then that CGI was amazing. Looking at it now, it's a little it's dated. Rubbery. Yeah, it's not but awful. The thing is, but it's dated. It's dated. But the thing is, it's like not yeah, that the rest of that movie though. It still holds up. Yeah. It's still a beautiful movie. It's so tricky dealing with humans when it comes to CGI. There's sure. you look at book one. Yeah. It has that issue a little bit. Like I want to feel like Tarkin is not as weird as he looks, but he looks a little weird. I want to think that Leia looks okay, but it's weirding me out a little bit. Leia got me worse in Rogue One than Tarkin did. And it might be because yeah. they didn't they introduce Tarkin in like a reflection at one point. I'm yes. like, that isn't so bad. But then when you yeah. look right on him, it's just like mm. <laughs> <laughs> a little a little weird. Um, turn around, buddy, turn around. <laughs> <laughs> go go look at that again. Let's talk through the mirror. <laughs> um <laughs> But now, Tyler, do you have a particular film that you feel like you could watch, like, every day? No. And that's just who I am as a person, mostly because I can... I'm just somebody who needs to absorb something different continuously. Otherwise, I would get bored with it. Um, But, I mean, I certainly have my comfort boobies. Mm -hmm. If that's what you mean more so, I mean, uh, I can watch uh 1990s teenage mutant ninja turtles every week i could just like scroll and be like ooh, and i could just choose that or nacho libre like i don't care what you say it's a perfect movie jack um, Black is perfect yes uh love hot rod you can watch that just about any time um what else there are definitely some fun picks. I could definitely appreciate them. I guess you could say I've really turned around on Wally. Okay. I really turned around on Wally 
it's a really um i know not everybody likes it but i know some people love it i've really turned around on it um and i'm starting to watch that a lot more this year so um, that's one i've seen at least three times this year okay it's it's comfortable it's comfortable but it is a intriguing and fun movie to watch and it's also maybe our future <laughs> yeah <laughs> please Here to think about now Tyler. funny fact uh fun fact um if yeah. you don't know um when they were creating the movie that wasn't originally earth and when they went to the so um andrew stanton who's the director and writer mm -hmm. of the film uh he's has been a long time uh uh, writer and director for Pixar since the beginning um, of their film career, in the very least. Um, when he was writing the movie, he had all of Act One completely planned out. Like that never changed. Mm -hmm. um, him and Eve, that never changed. When they leave Earth and why they leave Earth, well, what was then just a trash world. Yeah. When they leave the planet, they're. Um, at one point, instead of uh, fat people who left Earth, um, the descendants of Earth, which is our uh, big fat blobs, they were just blob aliens. Hmm. So it was a completely different thing. And um, after a while, because, you know, like, you know, no, I want to say, I don't want to say no script, but normally a script goes through many, many changes. Mm -hmm before it is the actual film and wally is a huge example of that and they even said um in the future commentaries like because of that in mind they just like the trash world and all that and the blob aliens and all that those were those were separated from earth it wasn't really what they were trying to say it just happened to be relevant at the time yeah. when it was released so and it's, um it's so funny how that works it is funny how that works and it's just like i wonder if they had a similar thing with up it's just like i know i want to make this emotionally devastating first 10 minutes but then what's this old guy gonna do the whole rest of the movie and then they come up with which i think a lot of people forget so, sometimes yeah. just how weird up is it's so inconsistent it's such a weird movie. It is. Like, it's such an inconsistent movie because they show you in the beginning of the sequence when you see older uh, Carl, right? That's his name? Carl Fredrickson. There you yep. go. <laughs> you watch the movie a lot. Um, but um, so when you see older Carl and he obviously he's getting around like he's an old man. He goes down the stairs on the little rail thing. But somehow... He has no problem hauling a giant house behind him. He has no problem um, trekking through jungle like it's nothing with, with no breaks, without no pain, doesn't need to take medicine. He doesn't even have medicine, I don't think. They never for whatever should. reason. Um, and uh, he can throw furniture out of the window, but he can't go down the stairs. Well, you know he what? So. Bridge. It's funny because I'm writing that article about uh, Willy Wonka Ooh. and I'm really resisting the urge to have a whole entire paragraph just shitting on Uncle Joe, Grandpa Joe. Yeah, It's just like, dude, you've been slothing it for 20 years in this bed <laughs> when your family is starving. <laughs> but no, you got to go and take it and you're like dancing all around. So... <laughs> I guess Carl Fredrickson pulled a Grandpa Joe. Let me be real, though. <laughs> Would you be more excited to um, work at a McDonald's or go to Disney World for a week? You don't make a, like, you're not wrong. So you make a very fair point. But that also shows. You know, her, Joe's not a jerk. <laughs> it doesn't Carl, grow out it. That. Jeez. Now, Tyler, do you have a particular film that you feel like you connect with because it relates to another interest of yours? Ooh. That's a tough question. I've never thought of that. 
this is usually the question that most people do the most thinking on. Wow. Oh, okay. Uh, while I think about this, can you give an example of yours or somebody else's or something like that? I know. <laughs> so my second interview on here was with my brother and mm -hmm. we're both huge baseball fans. So like we talked baseball movies for a bit <laughs> when I asked him this question and like for me personally, like, um, I remember a film that hit way closer to me was the booksellers which was a documentary because i'm an avid reader and it was so okay. cool like taking a deep dive into books or i feel like a lot of documentaries lend themselves to this kind of thing because if it focuses on an interest of yours obviously you have a stronger connection to it but like i know one of my favorite documentaries is beyond the lighted stage because i love rush and mm. i can sit and watch that documentary over and over and over again but I guess it's like if any kind of your hobbies or interests that like they're in a they've been recounted or expressed in a film kind of thing. So are we just talking hobbies? It could be hobbies or interests or something that you care about that's not movie related but connects to a movie. Hmm. Wow, that's tough. We could come back. I mean, I have like so many different ways I can go about the question, to be honest. And I'm looking at a group of boobies right now to see if anything jumps out me, jumps out at me for that. Um. Okay, so three movies have come to mind. Two are to your hobby thing, and mm -hmm. one is a little more, I guess, an impersonal thing where it personally affected me. Actually, two, but I think I might do the second one. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to do the second one um, when I get to it. So, first off, um, I absolutely love watching over and over again Ford versus Ferrari. I, over the past few years, especially as I'm looking for a new car, I've increasingly have become more of a car nut. Mm -hmm. I've become more interested in racing and that sort of thing. And that movie just kind of hits it for me. I love driving. I love to learn how to performance drive later on and all that stuff. Like, I just find it more fascinating at this point, uh, just because of, it's the freedom of it, not necessarily the logistics and the mechanics and all that that i'm just i love the experience i love the fun of it i love the freedom of it it's kind of like how like some people like do certain sports for that reason like surfing skydiving whatever um another one of those is like boxing so for me that would be like creed okay it's a great um, and also it's kind of like a thing it's kind of in a position where i'm at right now where he uh, wants to become something he's trying to reach to a certain point. He's trying to make a name for himself. He's trying to um, do that. And I'm kind of in a position at the moment where I'm kind of working towards that way. So I kind of mm -hmm. connect with that. Um, so it's kind of dual purpose there. But I think the most where it really hits home for me on a personal level is a Disney movie, which I'm about. So I'm working on an article right now. Um, and I'm watching all the theatrically released feature films of uh, animated feature films awesome. of uh, Disney, Walt Disney. And um, I'm currently uh, in the middle of the 60s of that, of those movies at the moment. But um, one movie that they, uh, I feel like is underrated and is overlooked many times and to this point right now, it's my favorite movie, is um, Lilo and Stitch. Because I, growing up, I identified with Stitch. Which sounds weird because he's an alien and I am a human. <laughs> but um, I identified with him because... Um, I was not really... I never really... Growing up, even though 
it's been kind of like a weird thing back and forth, like where some points I did belong, some points I didn't belong. But I never really fully belonged in the social group. And I always like was kind of like the outsider. I was always kind of like an outcast. And I that and uh, throughout my childhood and even teenage years, and adolescence, um, like I've dealt with in a social standpoint of like having a hard time of finding uh, belonging with a set of group of people. And that's what he does throughout the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, because of course he's like a breed of, like he's just bred for destruction. But once that all that goes away, he's like, where do I belong? And what always gets me is when he is in the middle of the jungle and he's holding that book of the ugly duckling and he looks at the page and it says, I'm lost. And he just repeats that as it just pans out. Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. And I just like think of that, um, the younger version of myself. And I just like really connect with that. And I feel like that's just kind of been me as I've grown up. And so like for me and that reason, that movie just hits home for me in that degree. So, And that's interesting because that really hits on my next question, which was a movie character that you connect with on a personal level. So I appreciate Uh, it. I connect with the alien blue koala. There you go. Um, It's a great answer. Thank Um, you. Now, my next question is, what's this film? Do you have a film that you feel like that you love that would surprise people to find out that you love it? Mm, (laughs) I don't know. Um, some people have uh, like use this as like. All right, you, you talked to me for a few for about an hour at this point. Mm-hmm. Think of what is something you would not expect me to like, and we'll see if we can answer this question. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, one thing you really haven't talked about is like, are there any particular rom coms that you like? I'm glad you asked. Because I love Pride and Prejudice. Okay. I feel like that's one with guys in general. It's like, if they like a rom-com, they like Forgetting Sarah Marshall or like Friends with Benefit. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Or uh, even Palm Springs because it's got Andy Samberg. I love Palm Springs. (laughs) He's great. He's great. But Um, but like Pride and Prejudice, it's so weird because in high school, that was the first time I watched that movie. Because mm-hmm. it was an English class, we we're doing all this stuff for um, the author of the book, and um, it, oh, <laughs> such a weird comparison. Because like uh, two weeks before we watched *Pride and Prejudice*, we read and we watched *Gulliver's Travels*. So we read the actual book, and then we watched this stupid Jack Black movie, which I thought was absolutely horrible, and the whole class loved. Because they have no taste, and I don't care because I've never seen them again. <laughs> uh, and I haven't for a long time. Um, but um, uh, but two weeks after that, we were we read a little bit of Pride and Prejudice, and we watched Pride and Prejudice, and a lot of people were like, I don't know, I don't like the movie, and I'm like, I loved it. <laughs> oh, I love this movie. It's great. Um. I mean, it's kind of like, it, it, because of the dialogue, the dial, um, because it's of a certain time, you, it can get a little strange and it's mm-hmm. kind of hard to watch, but um, I really like it. I think it's really good. I think it's a great romantic comedy that doesn't get too weird mm-hmm. with romance. Like, sense and sensibility can get a little weird because if you don't know, um, it deals with a girl who's in her early 20s and an older man who's in his late 40s. Just that, if you will. <laughs> and, you know, you look at a movie that people love, like Beauty and the Beast, and you look at their relationship, it's Stockholm Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome, the movie. <laughs> but, it's a... But, in Pride and Prejudice, it's like, it gets... It, like, it, the movie is the title. Mm-hmm. It there's a lot of pride and there's a lot of prejudice but because of that they learn more about each other and it's kind of a beautiful story about these two unlikely people 
to be the most likeliest couple for each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it has a great arc of love um, between them. And also, if you like that kind of downtown Abbey, of course, this is earlier than downtown Abbey as far as time. Mm -hmm. Because it's early 18th century. This is not early 19th century. Yeah. Um, I mean, 20th century. Uh, that's what I meant to say. It's not early 20th century. It's early 19th century. Trust me. I, I know when, when they take place. Um, I knew what you meant. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, um, if you like that kind of period and you like those kind of movies, it's a definitely comfortable um, watch and it's I think it's a stellar movie um, it has Karen Knightley um, Rosamund Pike who's you can't get a bad well you can but she usually gives a good performance in movies um, it's got Carrie Mulligan in the film um, Dol Donald Sutherland is in the film and a few other British actors that you probably never heard of, but you will once you watch the movie. So there you go. And those faces that you recognize, you're like, yeah, I've seen that person. Mm hmm But that's, yeah, that's mostly it. But yeah, I, I really enjoy the movie. I have a fun time with it. And I think that qualifies as my answer. I'll add it to my watch list. Ooh, yes. Because I have um, not seen this one. Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's a good one. Um, yeah, it might not, and like any romance movie, is it realistic? Probably not, but it's a, it's fantasy. It's, like, I feel like romance is the kind of thing where you can get as realistic and as grounded as you want, and then this is movies in general. It's unrealistic to a degree. Yeah. Gotta throw that romance in there. Mm-hmm. Has to feel magical. Like I um I'm a huge fan of Emma that came out last year. I need to watch it. It's it has such a great look to it too, but it's yeah. so zany and fun. And it reminds me of a Wes Anderson movie. It has that look to it. It's so pastel to everything. <laughs> and it feels so Wes Anderson, but extremely British, but in a good way. Yeah. It's a great way to put it. Might be why I loved it as I look at my three Wes Anderson posters in front of me. Um, now, thank you. Now, my last question for you, and honestly, I think you hit on this a little bit at the very beginning of this interview is, but Tyler, what do you love most about movies? I love storytelling. Um, I feel like that's the biggest thing about movies, and that's what I notice more most about a film. Um, some people like to point on the technical aspects. Some people um, just want to say what they got out of the movie. I kind of do the same thing, but I feel like the biggest thing is the story that it tells because I feel like even the most meh movie for you has something to say and you can mm -hmm. understand what it's trying to say. Um, there's some movies that it's more so about the comedy or the adventure than it is about the actual story, which in that becomes a bit of a difficult to you when I write things like uh, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, that's a big example. Because I'm like, what? There's not really a story here. I mean, there is, but it's like, it's just they just wild antics. Little, that's all it is. They just wanted those weird little burgers. Yeah, that's oh. all. <laughs> like, it's nothing that crazy or, um, or uh, nuanced or anything like that, but it's a great movie regardless. Um, but um, like even an action movie, that's hard to do that because uh, like Predator was a little hard to write up because um, really it's just about the experience than it is the story because the story is simple and clear. They're being hunted by a alien that is meant to hunt down the hunters. Exactly. It's the whole premise. You just get as many big testosterone action movie people yep. and have alien hunt them. For sure. And um, But I feel like on that note, um, I think when it turns to a movie uh, like 
John Wick, which um, is a fantastic action movie, and it really turned things around for action films in the mid 2010s. Um, I believe John Wick is something that is such entertaining, brutal action while also having a simple but meaningful story. Because you understand clearly what his reasons are, and that is the driving force of the film. And that's why I feel like if you can jump, where as ridiculous as it is, and some people are like, oh, he's doing this all for a dog. He's doing, he's doing this all because of what the dog meant. Yep. It's the symbolism. Uh, this was a carefully written um, story to really um, give some reasoning to what is going on within the film. Um, and it just so happens to uh, be a, the, this guy who's getting hurt is a one-man army. Yes. Bobby, yeah. But, yeah, I, but on that, I think that's just my favorite part of it, and it's that main reason. I mean, that just explains why certain movies are my favorites, because of the story they tell, of the nuance of the story. Um, and some movies are just more so about the story than they are about anything else, like Goodwill Hunting is a good example for me um, when it comes to that. Uh, Blade Runner, huge example for that, I mentioned earlier. Um, I feel like a good example of something that came out recently is The Mitchells versus The Machines. And that movie is incredibly fun, incredibly zany, as super relevant comedy has some beautiful animation, but it tells a really heartfelt story. Um, and uh, it, it got me, I'll tell you what. Like, it sure got me too. <laughs> I related to it. And um, but also more than that, like for those who probably don't relate to it, it there is a particular scene that nails why the dad's the way that he is. And it's a realistic reason. Mm -hmm. It's a grounded reason. Ooh, ooh, okay. Uh, here's another example. Because I'm uh, posting this today when I meant to post this two days ago. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, Train to Busan. I don't know if you ever heard of it or seen yes. it. It's a South Korean zombie movie that takes place on a train. Um, most of the movie. And it's all as crazy and as stressful and as colorful as some characters may be and as terrifying as zombies are again in this movie. Um, this, uh, this film is first and foremost a father-daughter story. Yep. And that grounds it. And I love that it is more so about uh, loss and love than it is about the harshness of humanity. Because we get that in all apocalyptic movies and it's fun to mix it up. And it's a incredibly emotional film and it's depressing at the end, but it, it takes you somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what a movie should do. If a movie you love will take you somewhere, it'll take you to a place that will impact you and it will make you feel something. And do you love it because of that? Awesome. It's all about the stories. Mm -hmm. Now, Tyler, always wrap up the show with allowing my guests to ask me a question. So Ooh. what question would you like to ask me? Hmm. Let me think. When I ask a question, I always like to think about it because I like to ask interesting questions. I appreciate interesting questions. Hmm. This is going to be a long pause. I'm just telling you. <laughs> that is okay. 
All right. All right. Mm hmm. How about you talk about a movie that you believe has a great story while I think about this question so we don't bore people? Hmm. Movie that I think has a great story. I feel like... That's not my question, by the way. That's just, just to buy me time. No problem. It's interesting because I'm one of those kinds of fans of film that I love the art of film and but and i can enjoy something where so i'm going to use this as an example to talk on a uh soapbox for a second because one of my favorite films of all time is mad max fury road mm. and i hear from so many people this movie has no plot just one long chase and what I love so much about it is there's one particular scene in it, the turning point of the scene, where this whole story is about this woman, Furiosa, trying to get these young women to the green place, a place better than where they're from. And when they find it, and that it's just desolate at this point, it's heartbreaking. And then all they have in front of them is just open desert. And it's like when Max stops them and tells them, you could limp out all the way into this desert and hope that you happen to find something better on the other side. Or you could turn back around and head straight forward into adversity, back to a place where you can thrive and really live. And Max's dealing with so much because he's seen so much loss over the course of his life and these years in this wasteland and those ghosts, which I thought that was so interesting in this film that they actually made them like materialize to him. I thought that was an interesting thing in this film. And he has to confront those ghosts and find his humanity again, instead of just being somebody who just wanders and just scrapes by. And he confronts that and realizes he actually has to confront the adversity in front of him. And boy, does it turn out to be an amazing climax of a movie. But there's so much motivation and subtler things there. Because every single character in that movie has a story. We don't even know most of them. Why is there some dude with this flaming guitar oh. <laughs> wearing his mom's face? That's like, he is wearing the face of his mother. What's this doof warrior about? What's Nux about? Everybody has their motivations and it has a lot to say too, because you look at, um, you look at Immortan Joe, he represents so much that's really relevant today too. And you can tell people you don't need water water weakens you and that just represents how much gasoline we all need the guzzling it's all we need and he has all of his all these war boys that worship at his altar and there's so much context to it all thrown in to a two-hour ridiculously intense adrenaline rush of a movie Yep. So for all of you out there that don't think there's anything to ha that has that movie has to say or a plot, we watch it. Watch it. Look at it again. Exactly. Watch it on the biggest screen you can. Oh, I was my insides were shaking watching that movie in a the theater. It was so you see this? You don't watch it on this. Yes. You're doing not doing enough justice. But do you have your question? Yes, I do. What's the question? Uh, this is relevant because I watched two, I saw two movies in theaters this weekend. Mm -hmm. I've already got my two, so I was feeling a little more confident, so that's yeah. why. Um, but I saw two movies and it made me think of this question because I didn't really care for the film, but I felt like the performance elevated it. So okay. my question is. What is the greatest performance you've seen in a mediocre generic film? Or the one that stands out to mind? 
I could definitely think of a lot of films that like there's so many answers I can think of here but like thinking what's processing in my head of like a performance that made a film Mm. like I love Scent of a Woman if Al Pacino wasn't in this movie do you think anybody would remember that movie I know a lot of people that don't even like it even with Al Pacino's performance in it but it's very memorable and crazy and fun um I have to give us another watch but I remember Darkest Hour and Joe Wright's a very talented director with um Gary that? Oldman playing Winston Churchill oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yes but a couple of years afterwards now all I can remember is Gary Oldman yeah and, he's the driving force of that movie and like I need to like go back and like is there enough around him to make this a truly memorable movie Not and really. um judy that mm. movie would not like i don't think that would have had any attention yeah. if it wasn't for renee zellweger so yeah. there's obviously enough of them like around right now mm-hmm. um like it's really hard to find a bad daniel day lewis movie um but like nine besides daniel day lewis and a lot of the music there's not a whole lot of substance to that movie yeah and it's Daniel Day-Lewis. He definitely did his best. And there's... I'm trying to think of, like, a really bad movie that I thought had some great... Perf- like, a great performance in off the top of my head. Like, I'm looking around my my movies and I'm like, would I own any movies like that? To give and, reference, the movie that came to mind to ask this question was uh-huh. Those Who Wish Me Dead. Okay. With Angelina Jolie, because I saw that recently, and um, I'm a fan of Taylor Sheridan. Me too. But the movie was a little e. Eh. It, it was um, definitely one of his weakest yeah. grips. But I felt like Angelina Jolie was the most interesting part of the film. Mm-hmm. I thought she was really the driving force of the movie. Um, I know a and, famous example, going back to our buddy Clint it's like mm. Jay Edgar, which I actually haven't seen it. But from what I understand is Leo goes all in on this movie. But apparently it is a slog. It is a very boring and drawn out movie. And right. that's so tough because, you know, there's so many like big Oscar Beatty movies that come out. Yeah. that have great performances at the center. And you're just like, what the hell is the rest of this movie? <laughs> and... It's a good question, and there obviously there's definitely a few immediate ones that I can think of. But I think like, a big one that people love is, uh, and it's a little problematic because of where we are right now as a culture, which is uh, remember the Titans, and Denzel's performance mm-hmm. is the highlight of the movie, and it's the best part of the movie, and it's what you remember the movie. That's what you go back for in the movie. And there, of course, are good actors and good performances um, within the film, but it's really Denzel who uplifts the film. And uh, I'm trying to think of another example. Honestly, I can think of, like, specifically with Denzel, the Equalizer movies. I think mm. you're like, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine. But, like, fine. Denzel's great. And honestly, a lot of what Liam Neeson has done in the past, like, 15 years. For me, I have a good example. Uh, Phantom Menace. Uh, Liam Neeson. For me, he's the best part of the movie because he actually gives a good performance, in my opinion, compared to everybody else. Comparatively. Like... It makes me so like watching Phantom Menace now and just seeing how wooden everybody is in that movie. I'm just like, what was George Lucas telling them to do? And I think I would even throw in another prequel, like you McGregor. Yeah, Revenge of the in, Sith. In like Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, he's oh, on like, a whole other level of those movies. And I like 
there are certain actors that get pulled down by bad material, and I feel like there's a lot of actors in the prequel trilogy that get pulled Charlie down. Charlie Portman. Yeah. Some of the um, he's, um, he's been to, uh, Sam Jackson. There's like two moments in all those movies where it actually felt like Sam Jackson. Where it's like, I don't think so. I'm just like, oh, there he is. There's a little glimmer. Or when he shows up in the arena with his lightsaber, he's like, party's over. Yes. <laughs> and and you see his actual purple lightsaber and he gets it. Specifically in Revenge of the Sith, where um, Anakin's like, I think the um, I like, think the Chancellor's a Sith Lord. And he's like, a Sith Lord? And I'm just like, oh my God, it's Samuel L. Jackson. Where has this been? <laughs> in these movies. Sam? Is that you? <laughs> but like you and McGregor, though, he's having so much fun, and obviously he's made an impact on people because mm-hmm. we're getting an Obi Wan show and the meme. And I saw earlier that um, by the time Kenobi comes out, it'll be twenty three years since um, uh, Phantom Menace came out, and the series takes place twenty three years exactly after the events of Phantom Menace. Look at that. Then they just need to make Beautiful. him age like 30 extra years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he becomes Alec Guinness. <laughs> no. Um, but um, Timeline, Mike. All right, so I know we're closing up. Mm-hmm. But I thought of a better question. Okay. And maybe you can include this later on with things if you like it that much. But what is your, and I'll give mine as well, what is your favorite ensemble movie? Oh, because we can talk about actors, but like a good ensemble, that like that's something special. Some of the ones that have come to mind, because like not gonna lie, the past couple of years there have been a lot of great ensemble pieces, and one that comes to mind real quick is *Knives Out*. Is I'm so excited for the sequel. I'm so excited for the sequel. <laughs> like every other day, we get another person confirmed for it, and it's just like yes. Dude, I saw Army of the Dead this weekend, and eh, eh, talk about that later. But um, or another time, I'm gonna post it on my thing later if you want to mm-hmm. find out what I thought about it before it hits Netflix. But I'm watching it. I'm like, I'm so excited. Batista is yeah. gonna be with Craig again. Yeah, and um, Janelle Monae, Catherine Hahn, and Edward Norton. That's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be great. I can't wait for more about that movie. It's gonna find more donut holes and these donut holes. <laughs> well, like the whole entire cast of Knives Out is ridiculous. It comes with a box of donuts. <laughs> yeah, it's so great, and some other ones too. Like, um, for me, and I feel like a lot of people steer away from it because of the time, and it feels a little slow. But I love it because I think it's one of this director's best. And it's The Hateful Eight. Yes. That was a perfectly cast movie. Like, everybody was so great in it. Yeah, and I feel like that's one of his least controversial movies. Because you understand what's really going on with that movie and why certain things are the way they are. And to be honest, they're all bad people. And you get it. Exactly. Or Obi. Obi was oh. like the only only decent person in that whole And they all love Obi. Yeah. They all do. <laughs> Poor Obi. And that's a great example. Like a lot of Tarantino movies are great yeah. ensembles. But like um one that I was gonna bring up, I love Bad Times at the El Royale. And yes. maybe Dakota Johnson aside. Okay. Maybe, Everybody okay. else is like great. Jeff Bridges, great. Um, Chris Hemsworth, yes, Hemsworth, yep, and Cynth- such an unlikely role. Cynthia Revo, like mm-hmm. that's like a star making performance that she gave. John Ham, and then John Ham. Um, another one. Oh, in the- and uh, Bill Pullman's son. Is that really Bill Pullman's son? Yes. Oh my god, it's like Jack Wade. It looks nothing like his dad. It's so funny because that whole entire, you know what? He has similar facial expressions. 
Yeah. And, oh my God, my mind's blown now. Um, no. But it's funny watching the trailer. It's just like, is that Tom Holland? Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure a lot of people thought that it was a state like, yeah. and then one that this one just randomly popped in my head, but I'm also a big fan of British things. Gosford Park. I haven't heard of this. What's this? Give me, this, give me, give me, give me the box art. Show so, me the Blu-ray. Show me the DVD. What you got? It's a murder mystery. Ooh, Gosford Park. Okay. And this is from this was a Robert Altman film, Ooh. which was strange. But what year? This is what year was this? Two thousand two. This was nominated for oh, okay. Best Picture. And we got. Uh, some of the people in here. So Bob Balban, Charles Dance before Game of Thrones, um, Stephen Fry, Michael Gambon, Richard E. Grant, Derek Jacobi, Kelly McDonald, Hel Helen Mirren. Where is this man? Where is this movie man? Ryan Philippi. You, this definitely dates that because Ryan Philippi was still a thing. Um, Maggie Smith, Kristen Scott Thomas, uh, Emily Watson. There's just a lot of people in this movie. And... I remember Gosford so Park. Okay, I'm gonna find this. So this is really funny. So I remember I used to do DVD. I love Clue. Also a great ensemble. Though. Yes, that's and that's not like big name people in Clue for the most part. No, perfect. Um, but you can't remake that movie. You please can't. don't. Don't you dare. Movie gods, don't do it. Don't do that to us. Um, but. I remember I had a movie club through the mail and the first two DVDs that came were signs, which has a special place in my heart, scared the living crap out of. Yeah, it got uh, spoiled for me. So 11 year old Shane got <laughs> scared crazy. 11 by that year old movie. what? Hmm? 11 year old what? Shane. Oh, you. Of yes, you, 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 you. I thought you were saying the title of the movie. I'm like, what? No, 11-year-old me was terrified of Signs when that came okay. out. I'm turning 30 this year, so when Signs came out, I was around 11 when that came out. And then this was another one. And as an 11-year-old, I thought this movie was stupid and boring. And then I watched it as an adult. I'm like, how could you? How dare you say that about this movie? So that's the thing about cool. age. Um taste eventually gets better exactly this is the same kid that used to watch delta farce over and over again with uh larry the cable guy and bill langvall and dj qualls so yeah. but on that note I'm gonna wrap things up but tyler thank you for coming on shamelessly plug one thank last time me. so plug whatever you'd like to wrap up the show and then we'll wrap things up all right then as I said before, you can find me on Instagram um, as at T Tubs Reviews, T underscore T U B B Z Reviews. And um, you can also find me as Tyler Beckett on um, Scribe Magazine on their website. Uh, I currently have five articles. I'm working on SACE, um, which should be. Um, out in June, um, working on something for Disney. I've talked about, if you like Pixar, I've talked about Pixar. You like Star Wars, I've talked about Star Wars. If you love Invincible, which you should, I talked about Invincible, um, the Amazon series. Oh Vice versa, if you just want to find a unique perspective and really see what I'm talking about with storytelling and uh, movies, check me out on Scribe Mag. Check me out on Instagram. That's all I gotta say. Give a follow. Go do it right now. But thank you, Tyler, for coming on. And thank all of you out there for always supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.